Hello everybody, welcome back to Witch Fix. Today we're looking at the rare thing on this channel, a book that is not a book from the Private series. You will surely come to understand what this means, but uh, basically the last, like, I don't know, eight episodes that I've actually recorded, not that will have gone out, have all been books from the Private series. I've been kind of obsessed with getting to the end of that, and I'm now going back in and slotting in other books that I should have been reading. Uh, this book is actually one that I bought um, in the run-up to or just post-Christmas, I had the opportunity to get my hands on a copy on eBay, where else? And I absolutely jumped at the chance, this has been on my to-read list for a while, though I didn't really know much about it, but I've said before how intrigued I am by personal accounts of the lives of witches uh, and their sort of personal experience of the craft, specifically like village witches, wise women, people who aren't necessarily in that wicker or that wicker derived modern witchcraft movement. Uh, so this was an absolute must read for me. It's called Seasonal Magic Diary of a Village, which by Paddy Slade, and then the back of it is thusly, I think this is taken from the introduction or forward. This book is about seasonal magic, that is the stuff used by country witches, it is of the earth. Rites for the festivals, animal and herb lore, spells, chants, recipes, folk remedies, snippets of knowledge and a candid view of the witches world are all here. Written with humour, common sense, genuine knowledge and a deep love of the subject itself by a bona fide village witch. Also included is Paddy's famous, though not so serious, rite of chocolate, an experience not to be missed. Uh, so that's sort of a, a take on what is in the book. It is not very long. It is about 200 pages, maybe like one or two pages longer than that. And the book is essentially entirely made up of chapters which are about the different sabbats. Uh, there's a couple of things at the end, like the right of chocolate, which kind of don't fit in anywhere. And so I'll, I'll put at the end. Uh, but for the most part, it is just about the sabbats. And I think I've said before that the part of books that are about the sabbats it's like the least interesting part of books to me, so why would I want to read this book? Well, the thing that interested me about it when I was reading it is that it finally made sense of something that has been driving me crazy, and that is that the Wheel of the Year, as I learned it from like different like intro to Wicker books, makes no fucking sense. And this is broken down in Paddy's book because the Wheel of the Year it seems to be based on old festivals that are sort of bound up in like the rhythms of nature and harvest time and then a bunch of solar stuff which is put in on top of it so you're celebrating different things at different times of year but those two different types of like solar and nature rites have been conflated and confused and that always left me wondering like what the whole middle of the year was for so if you've ever wondered to yourself what is the difference between like the summer solstice and lammas and basically all those kind of summer spring rites that don't seem to make a lick of sense to me because they all seem to be about the harvest and it's like well how many times are we doing this because they, these all seem the same if you've ever felt like that this book really makes a whole lot of sense out of what is actually being celebrated at that point and i'm gonna go away from this and redraw my wheel of the year to take into account these things it even talks about how dates in the calendar have moved uh, which is why some of the celebrations used to be on different days and all of that good stuff so that is incredibly informative uh, but the rest of the book as i've said is is basically about how to celebrate those sabbats and rites rituals law surrounding them but it's all told with this really nice kind of humorous wry tone and even though i didn't agree with a lot like some of the things in the book they were all very interesting to read and were put forth as the author's opinion as opposed to fact which is always my favorite method of like learning from somebody is just to hear what they think and then thinking well do i agree with that or do i not so from the very start of the introduction we get like laid down the law on basically this author's beliefs we talk about um black and white magic first off the bat uh, which i found quite interesting because it says on page seven <laughs> 
I'm not even sure what black magic is, but I have a niggling feeling it owes much to Dee Wheatley and A. Crowley, neither of which knew much about witches. Of course, both black magic and the two aforementioned gentlemen owe a great deal to two other gentlemen of a far earlier time, the authors of Malleus Maleficarum, Kramer and Springler, of whom it has been said that if magicians did not know how to worship the devil before reading it, they certainly did after doing so. Wheatley and Crowley appear to have culled most of their knowledge from the transcripts of the witch trials, and these were the results of what happens when sexually frustrated men allow their imaginations to run riot, forcing poor illiterate old women, who were for the most part not witches, to confess to anything to relieve the agony inflicted upon their bodies and minds. So, in just that paragraph, we've taken down like the idea of there being such a thing as black and white magic, the idea that witches worship the devil, and the concept that the witch trials were actually about hunting witches. Um, which is all stuff that I basically agree with. Too many people are like, we're the witches of the grandchildren of the, you know, that sort of fucking rubbish. And it's like, no, because those women were just Christian women who were probably also scared of witches. Uh, and then they got murdered for fun and profit. Uh, so there we go. That's quite interesting. And then even just like on to page eight, talking about like, the ritual sacrifice page nine talking about covens and people's beliefs of witchcraft being kind of influenced by wicca uh, so for example it says Coffins are and were led by women, not men, and the village witch worked by herself. She had no need of a coven, which is merely part of the Latin word meaning to gather. It also implied a fraudulent gathering. It is difficult enough to gather 13 people nowadays at a specific time and date, especially if that date falls in the middle of the week. At a time of curfew, when one needed to cover miles across other people's land and could be prosecuted, beaten and deported for doing so, it would have been practically impossible unless... As has been said, the group was a family or village one. So again, like taking a shot at this idea that the old ways have been practiced in secret by people meeting up on the moors regularly to conduct witchcraft rites in the style of a gardenarian coven, which seems quite unlikely. Um, but also like talking about how people practice like obviously within families and then you don't have to go anywhere, you're just already at home. Uh, following that is the paragraph, there are witch groups today who meet on the nearest Saturday to a traditional hereditary witch. This is nonsense. One either works to the proper times and tides or not at all, uh, with as many or as few dedicated people as can come. You worked clothed, not that silly phrase, sky clad, because no tribe, primitive or otherwise, goes to meet its god unclothed. So you can kind of get from the, the sections that I've read out the kind of ideas that this author is putting forward, this kind of idea that the reinvention of witchcraft as Wicca is infiltrated by a number of other sources. It's not coming pure from what people were doing prior to that. Um, Paddy Slade, I think, from looking her up, was born in the 1930s. Um, so born pre-Wicca. Um, so there's quite interesting ideas here. Obviously, again, like the idea that you're going to go creeping off across some field full of thistles and nettles and then take all of your clothes off and do a right secretly on pain of death on someone's land. You know, you're not going to want to have to run away from that butt ass naked. So um, there you go. I don't really have a problem with people going sky clad, but I have a problem with people insisting that that is the way it's always been done. Uh, so that's kind of like the tone going in. There are these little moments of humour and plain speaking throughout. In addition to talking about those like perceived ideas and, and purported traditions, she also like raises some interesting points about stuff that I'd never thought about. So for example, on page 14, We do not worship the moon now. We know that the moon is a reflection of the earth. What we see in the moon is the aspects of our lady mother of the earth. We relate the first quarter to the spring, dawn and the maiden, the full to summer, midday and the mother, the last quarter to autumn, evening and the crone, and do not forget the dark to winter, midnight and the dark goddess, the goddess of death and rebirth, the goddess uh, facing both ways. I get somewhat aggravated by the insistence of modern witches that there are only three aspects of the goddess. There are four seasons, four major times of day and at least four major times of life, birth, puberty, the menopause and death. Yeah. <laughs> 
which again is something I never really thought about because we tend to put like the waning moon and the new moon together as one and just say yeah that's the crown stuff the full moon is the mother the waxing moon is the maiden but it doesn't really make sense for the crone to get two phases together especially to ignore the, the whole idea that like death is a part of life so it really made me examine some of those old tropes and things that you start learning the minute you crack open your first book on wicca um, and there's a lot of interesting stuff in there there's a lot of interesting stuff as i've said in the chapters about the um sabbats we start off with Samhain and then circle around the year um all the way back again there's information in there about which animals and plants um are seen around at this time of day it's obviously from a very british centric uh, point of view which is you know where i live so that makes a lot of sense to me but obviously if you're living in like australia or north america these things aren't necessarily going to apply to you because i don't know if america has hawthorn bushes and all that stuff but for british it, it's pretty much there um this is the section where she starts talking about the kind of overlaying of two different systems so you've got like the solar celebrations around the year but then also like the fertility uh, stuff which always kind of bothered me like sometimes at, the, at festivals they talk about like the holly and the oak king fighting and then it's sometimes like young man being born like next summer being born and it all seems to happen like out of order and out of sequence and i've always had trouble getting my head around a bit and uh, this is what she says on page 17. Our ancient ancestors had only two seasons, winter, which began with the frosts, and summer, which began with the hawthorn blossom. There is another version of this, summer begins with the elder blossom and winter with the berries. The other two rites are imolk, or oimelk, where the lambs are born and ewes come into milk, and the snowdrops show themselves, and lunasad, which is the beginning of the harvest. The other rites are solar ones and were imposed on the old religion, not in any arbitrary way, but in the nature of tribal development and evolution of a theme. The times of these eight rites are almost equally divided, seven weeks from a solar to a nature rite and six from nature to solar, giving us four equal di divisions of 13 weeks in a year. So that was kind of interesting to me, this kind of reworking of, or sort of unworking of the Wheel of the Year, was probably the most important thing that I got out of this book, uh, the kind of idea that it made sense to me, more like the stories, the rhythms that it was talking about, the different seasons, it was all pretty good. Although most of the rites given are to do as a group, there isn't like a lot of solo, uh, like solo stuff in there, um, but there's stuff that you could adapt if you wanted to, and there's various spells and chants and things supplied, uh, as well as the symbolism of various stones and plants. I think this is a really valuable reference book to have to hand if you're having trouble understanding the Wheel of the Year, but if you're also interested in reading about someone else's traditions, um, things that they've picked up from outside of uh, Wicca and what I'm gonna call like Wicca light, which is sort of like the mainstream witchcraft that's coming out at the moment. It's basically just Wicca, but you say it's not a religion and maybe don't worship a goddess and god. Basically the only difference. Most of the like Wheel of the Years stuff, a lot of the like magical stuff is, is just the sort of tables of correspondences from old Scott Cunningham books. So if you want something that hasn't been I don't want to say like tainted, but I guess influenced and informed by that more recent um, trend. This is a great book to read. I'm still kind of dipping my toes in the water of traditional witchcraft and reading a little bit about it. Um, this book felt pretty good and it's actually going to probably go into my like permanent collection just to refer back to at the times of like the different sabbats, the different uh, times of year, just to read up on what it is I'm meant to be celebrating and then also to redraw my Wheel of the Year so that I actually understand what is going on through it because it's never been something that really spoke to me and I think the reason for that is because it's just kind of muddled up in my head from lots of different sources. So it's probably going to become a pretty handy reference book and if you can get hold of a copy of it there's usually one or two around on eBay but it's not something that I've seen a lot on there uh, so it might be kind of limited print run or just not widely available um do get yourself a copy i don't know if you can get it in ebook but kind of a valuable read quite a short read but very very dense 
uh, and packed with a lot of law sometimes to its detriment like it can be a little bit impenetrable at times some paragraphs feel like they just switch subject halfway through as if it's being dictated by someone who's gone on a bit of a ramble um so at times it can be a little bit difficult to read and it kind of switches between different ideas and different topics sometimes talking about you know what tarot card but then going into astrology and various other things so there's a little bit of hit and miss in areas uh, there are some sections that are just like long path workings, which I don't know how useful that is because I guess most people for path workings need to have it like read out to them, which obviously if you're on your own, that's not terribly useful unless you record yourself saying it. Uh, but, you know, to each their own. I think there's something in here that everyone will enjoy, uh, but that it does kind of chop and change a little bit and the chapters themselves aren't set out like, here is what this Sabbath is about, here is the animal, here is the plant. It very much seems to change depending on like the mood that the author is in. Like some chapters have the tarot thing, some don't, I think. Like some have some information and some don't talk about that in relation to other Sabbaths. So it is a little bit kind of higgledy pickledy in there, it's particularly in the midsection, but there's definitely something in there if you if you want to read it. Uh, and you can definitely get something from it. Uh, make sure you let me know your recommendations if you have any other books you'd like me to read that are a bit like diary-like or more related to traditional witchcraft because I've enjoyed the ones that I have looked at and I am always looking for more books because I have a problem with buying a lot of books. Don't forget to go follow over on Instagram at Witchfix Podcast and on Twitter as well. And in the meantime, I'll see you in the next one.